Today I'm going to show you how to make a funnel neck on a sweater. It's actually really easy. I'm working with patterns from the Answer Ladies Machine Knitting Notebook, which is available in two volumes, one for standard and bulky, one for mid-gauge. We'll do a plain one and a fancy one. Basically, a funnel neck is just a neck without any shaping that is made wide enough to allow the head to go through anyway and you knit extra rows up to the top of it. The funnel neck begins on page 54 of the knitting notebooks. Over the next couple of pages, there are some explanations of how to choose the width and who it's suitable for. Basically, adults. Children's heads in proportion to their bodies are enough larger than adults that until the teen years, the style doesn't work well. And there is a chart on 56 showing you how to figure width and length of the desired funnel. The easiest way to envision what's going on is just to knit, so let's do that. Here I've knitted the front of the plain funnel neck blouse shown at the beginning of the movie, and I'm just in the process of binding off the shoulders. I'm taking four rows rather than two to bind off, which is a refinement that I will show you in a different movie about making the shoulders fit more neatly. You can't see me very well right here. I'm sorry I got out of the frame, but I'm binding off the three or four stitches that represent half of the shoulder stitches on the left. You did see me do it on the right. Here I come back to the right to bind off the remainder of them. You probably recall that on the back of the basic crew neck sweater, the Answer Ladies Knitting Notebook version doesn't have any shaping. It's straight across. That's typical of simple patterns. Some more advanced ones do have shallow shaping in the back. So what would happen after the second um, side is fully bound off, the last few stitches are being bound off now, is on the crew neck, we would simply bind off the neck stitches also. But instead, we're going to just knit straight up to create the funnel. And we will do that for both front and back. They will be just alike on the funnel neck. So we knit straight for whatever length we want, and there they are. Simply bind off, and here is what we just knitted. This funnel neck was about an inch and a half worth of extra rows, and it stands up and rolls out at the top. This time we're going to do a fancier version. In order to do this, you have to make take a note of your center needle, and you have to have an odd number of stitches because we have to have a true center needle to leave alone. We're going to create the lacy outline, and that begins a number of rows below the actual top of the sweater. I've got a chart in the book that helps you figure out how many rows and to create your own custom length of neckline. The number of stitches in the width of the neckline is the determining factor in how many rows it's going to take to create that outline because we start at the center and we keep moving stitches out. So here is the first piece of video again. What we do is leaving the center stitch exactly at the same place it always has been, we lift two stitches to the left of it and move them over one needle space to the left, two to the right, and do the same. The empty needles stay in work and you need to keep watch and make sure that they do start knitting again because that's part of what creates the look. One surprise is that you don't always get a lacy look. I certainly did with the Premier Bloom yarn, but the yarn for the purple sample was fluffier and it filled in the holes. You can also get the filled in look on purpose by lifting two stitches on the tool that moves outward, but lifting the stitch off of the receiving needle first and after moving the two outward, crossing it behind them and putting it on the needle nearest the center. That's a subject for another video. To get the V-shaped lines of lacy holes and the outline, we progressively move outward. So the stitches that we select to move outward every successive transfer are one needle space over outward from the previous time. Sighting up from the previous lace hole that was made will help you keep track. Let me try to describe it clearly. You have a two-prong tool, so you're picking up 
two stitches at the same time. The innermost stitch is the one that will create the hole because its needle will end up empty. So you want to orient the tool one stitch outward from the position where the lace hole occurred last time. In other words, don't put the tool on the same needle that received a lace eyelet last time. Put it one needle outward from that, and that will keep your eyelets forming in a nice V shape. These two stitches were moved outward the first time, leaving eyelets. The next time, these two stitches were moved, leaving eyelets. And the next time, these were the ones moved out. Another rule of thumb is to remember is that there should always be an odd number of stitches between the eyelets. We began with one stitch between the eyelets. Then there were three, five, and by this row there are seven, and it will go that way on the, all the way up. Because we're moving stitches out without making an empty spot for them, this is the area that has received the stitches and is doubled. Those stitches were situated on the outer prong of the tool, and these are the stitches from the inner prong. We did make an empty space for them, being as how that stitch originated on the needle, then was lifted on the outer prong, and when we moved the whole pair of them out, there was an open spot to receive that stitch. This very simple process adds a lot of drama for not a lot of work. For those who are interested, there is a link to the sale page for the Answer Ladies Machine Knitting Notebooks in the program notes.